Jesus at the center of it all. Actually, this church speaking here is very stressful. We've got our brother Yuzon down there already showing me the timer. <laughs> I'm given 45 minutes to share God's word with you. I just came back from uh, Cambodia uh, last week. I spent about three and a half days there teaching them on the tabernacle of Moses. And our Cambodian brothers and sisters send their love and their regards to each and every one of you here. Shall we come to the Lord's Prayer? Thank you, Jesus, for this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for being with us this morning, Father Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for the word that's going to be imparted from you. Thank you, Jesus, for your spirit of wisdom and revelation knowledge in the understanding of your word that will bring life to our bodies and bring life to our lives here on this earth. In Jesus' name, we give thanks and praise. Can we have the slides, please? Today, we're going to talk about the carnal mind versus the mind of Christ. It is taken from Philippians 2, 1 to 11. Now, the main theme throughout this whole sermon, actually the main theme throughout the whole Bible, is basically the carnal mind, which is the self against the spiritual mind, which is against God. On the carnal mind, pride disables our grace walk. Pride is basically self-dependence. Grace is basically God-dependent. So every time when we are filled with pride, filled with self, it disables our grace walk in this world. Amen? The carnal mind, our spiritual mind of Christ, that's the, carnal, that's the spiritual mind that we have. Being Christ-minded leads us to righteousness, peace and joy. Now, be joyful. The whole scripture verses from Philippians uh, 2, 1 to 11 basically talks about, or for that matter, the whole book of Philippians basically talks about joyfulness. That's why you have previous speakers, uh, Pastor Peter, Brother Yusuf was talking about being joyful. Joy, kara. Be rejoicing, kairo. Or is it gyro on the Indian dance? Eh? So being joyful is a way of life. And that is the hallmark of grace. As we walk the grace walk, we are filled with joy. We should be filled with joy. And we walk in the grace walk because of humility. Humility is where we divorce ourselves from ourselves and to be God-dependent versus being self-dependent. And then we will talk about Paul giving us the example of how we walk in humility. Not humility as man depicts humility to be. Oh, you must walk bent, you must drive a poor car. That is humility in, from man's standpoint. But God's humility is different. And we will share that with you this morning through the example of Christ's self-humiliation. And when you are Christ-dependent, our Father exalts Jesus Christ. Just as today we are in Christ, our Father will exalt us. We delight our Father. And when we delight our Father, He will delight us in that sense, and that's why we get joy. But, there is a but, which we will cover towards the end of the, the, the sermon. There is a but there, because if we are supposed to be humble, we cannot be humble by our own carnal efforts. We cannot be carnal, we cannot be humble by our own self-effort. That's why our God loves us so much that He gave us His Holy Spirit and He gave us His mind so that we can be humble from God's perspective. Amen? Amen. So we'll go to the first part, be joyful. That has been covered in Philippians 1 by, uh, again, Pastor Peter and uh, Brother Yusuf. Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, which is the physical, secular world, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's why you find that the book, uh, chapter 1 on Philippians, basically talks about the joy. It is a position that we have as a citizen in heaven. So we won't go through much of that because that has been covered by previous speakers. We will go to the part, oh sorry, before that. Joy is an attitude. I'm sure the previous speakers, if you haven't heard the sermons, please go and get the CDs or the, the YouTube thing. Joy is an attitude of the spiritual mind. Not a destination, but it's a way of life for each and every one of us. That's why Paul, while he was in prison, could be joyful. I was just commenting to my wife. I just got a report from uh, my tax agent that uh, this year I had to pay another 10000 in taxes. Now, how to be joyful? But I'm joyful because I must have earned some money for me to pay extra tax. Amen? So it's an attitude that we bring to the table. Joy is not from the carnal mind. That's why it's got to be an attitude where we have experienced joy from the spiritual mind of Christ. The carnal mind gives us emotion, our feeling, our intelligence. 
So these are all subject to the external influences of the world. That's why sometimes when we carry on in life, we are mindful of what other people think of us. While we should be carrying on in life, mindful of what Christ thinks of us. Amen? So we'll go on to the next part of hallmark of grace. Like I say, joyful part has been covered by previous speakers. What is the hallmark of grace? That's what Philippians 2, 1 tells us. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Now let's explore this a bit further. A grace community, I think Pastor Peter has spoken about that. A grace church, we are a church of grace. A grace believer, we are all believers of grace. That's why we are here in the new covenant church. We are not in the old covenant church. Amen? All of us have Christ in there. If we are supposed to display the attributes of grace, that's why we must have Jesus Christ in our lives, walking the walk for us. And that's how we can be a grace walker. All of grace believers, we walk in love, fellowshipping in the spirit. Whose spirit? Jesus' spirit. That's why we are now all together, all linked as a family by the Holy Spirit. That's why we can call each other brothers and sisters in Christ. Just as I was in Cambodia, uh, I felt so rewarded and so, so satisfying that when I pray for them, I was ministered to because I can, cannot go into the further reaches of the small villages in uh, Cambodia. But my brothers and sisters can. Your brothers and your sisters can. Amen? And that's why we are all united by the Holy Spirit. We are like-minded with the Holy Spirit, have the same love as the Holy Spirit. We are one accord with the Holy Spirit and one mind with the Holy Spirit. And that is the hallmark of grace. Philippians 2.2b tells us that being like-minded, having the same love, being a one accord of one mind. I could look at my clock. <laughs> I got to wait for EK to either cough or say amen. All of these things, like-minded, same love, one accord and one mind, can only happen through humility. And pride, Proverbs 13.10 tells us, pride is the root of all division, the root of all strife. Proverbs 13.10 tells us, by pride, which is the self, our flesh, comes nothing but strife. Pride goes before a fall, and honour before humility. Amen? We go to the next one, walk in humility. Now what does Paul have to say about walking in humility? Let's look at Philippians 2.3. Let nothing be done through selfish, selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. See, let's esteem others better than ourselves. Let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Every time, our Lord knows us so well. We, lock, we walk in self-interest. Let's look after the interests of others. Yeah? But what Philippians 2, 3 is saying is, let's forget about self. Let us put self aside. Don't be selfish. And if you take a step back and look at the whole forest of uh, Philippians 2.3 and 2.4, don't be selfish. This is basically yesterday. Put self aside basically today. Forget self is forever. So what Jesus is crying today, look, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you abide in me, you are away from all your selfishness. You are away from all your self-centeredness. You are away from all your pride. Amen? Pride promotes strife. You look at the, the chapter of James 4 on uh, strife, it's all about pride. James 4, 6, if you take one little portion of scripture from there, he gives more grace. Who gives more grace? Jesus. Jesus gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So the question is humility. And humility doesn't come naturally to us. Humility comes supernaturally to us through the walk of the Holy Spirit in us. Amen? Antidote to strife. If we have all this strife because of self, selfishness, how, what is the antidote to strife? That's why Jesus prescribed that humility of mind to be others-centered versus us being self-centered. But, like I said, there's a but there. Huh? Every time you say there's a but, it counters the whole thing. Huh? It is not the nature of our carnal mind. It's not the nature of ourselves to esteem others over self. Today, if I take a photograph of each and every one of you in a group and I pass out this photograph, guess who will be the face that you'll be looking at first? It's your own face. 
That's why by nature, we are selfish, we are self-centered. If I take a photograph of you now, you will say, hey, my face, huh? you shouldn't be taking me when I'm yawning. You shouldn't be taking my photograph when I'm sleeping. Yeah? So we always look at our face first. And that's to show you that and demonstrate to you a living proof that we are by nature self-centered. And we are self-centered is because Adam partook of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Or I paraphrase it as a tree of self. Yeah? So what is God's solution? That's why God gave us a solution. I'm giving you a new mind. A real, making you a new creation. You now have a new mind, the mind of Christ. You now have a new spirit, the spirit of Christ that's living in us. So that's why Romans 8, 6 tells us, be spiritually minded. If you are spiritually minded, it leads to life and peace. If you are carnally minded or self-minded, then it leads to death. So the choice is again up to us, whether we want to be spiritually minded or do you want to be Christ-minded. Let's move on to Philippians 2.5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's why the mind that we have, the spiritual mind that we have, is Jesus' mind. The question is how to activate it. So we will come to the but later on, the latter half of this uh, preaching. Yeah? When we are Christ-minded, that means when we are spiritually minded, we have revelation knowledge of our identity in Christ. Because the natural person who is carnally minded will never understand the things of the Spirit. So when we are spiritually minded, we have a revelation knowledge of our identity in Christ. That Christ works in us and empowers us. Amen? It is not us who work in ourselves to empower ourselves. And that's why we have this tree of life and the tree of self, as I was calling it. We go on to the next part, Christ's self-humiliation. The example of Christ's self-humiliation is the greatest example of how to read ourselves of self. Now, Christ humbled himself. Please note, he was not humble. Yeah, I think this is a very important truth that we must realize in, uh, for ourselves as believers in Christ. Christ was not murdered. So Christ was not humble, but he offered himself according to the will of the Father. That's why in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was saying, not my will be done, but your will, Father God. So Philippians 2, 6 basically covered Christ's humility in heaven. Philippians 2.7 covered Christ's humility in incarnation as a man on earth. Philippians 2.8 talks about Christ's humility in death. So we'll go through each portion of that scripture, 2.6, 2.7, and 2.8. 2.6, Christ's humility in heaven. Philippians 2.6 tells us, Who, being in the form of God, do not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now, I like this word robbery because this scripture verse is taken from uh, NKJV. Robbery suggests that you only rob the rich. Amen? And that's why Jesus doesn't consider it robbery because Christ is God and shed in the glory of God. Because the mind of Christ is given to you. What is given to you is not robbery. Amen? So we must understand that Christ is God and shed in the glory of God. We must realize that because God is, Christ is not just an average person, not a God. Therefore, when he comes down to earth and sacrifices himself for us, then some of the religious people will say that, oh, we've only got part of God in that sense. John 17, 5 tells us that he is God. And, know, and now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world. Ephesians tells us that God chose us from the foundations of the world. And Jesus Christ, the Son, was with God before the foundations of the world. So Jesus Christ is God. And that's why he is a fitting representation of us to take over the sins for the whole humanity, the whole mankind. Christ's equality with God qualifies him, therefore, for his humble descent to save his children, all of us here. Because if it's not God, if it's just a simple person, Li Cheng Wat, if I die today, I die for one person. But because he is God, when he dies today, he dies for the whole world. Amen? So Jesus means the Lord saves. That's why the Lord came here to save us. Now, Philippians 2.7 talks about Christ's humility in incarnation. Philippians 2.7, but made himself, Jesus Christ, of no reputation, taking the form of a born servant and coming in the likeness of man. Now, we must also understand that Christ did not lose his deity. Christ is 100% God and 100% man. 
I've got from time to time people come and tell me that, oh, Christ is 50% God and 50% man. No, 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 no. I believe that is non-doctrinal. Because when you have 50% God and 50% man, again, some legalistic personality is going to tell us that, hey, look, Jesus didn't die for me because 50% God part was not given to me. So I want to assure you today, brothers and sisters, God, Jesus Christ is 100% God and 100% man. So that when he died to represent, to take on the sins of humanity, we get 100% of his Zoe life. And that's what Brother E.K. was talking about. We get sozo. And sozo is not just being saved from hell. Sozo is a Greek word from being saved from everything. We get his health, we get salvation, we get his health, we get his wholesomeness, we get his uh, prosperity. Amen? Verse 7, taking the form of a born servant and coming in the likeness of man. Now, what does that tell us? Jesus washes the disciples' feet, John 13, 4. That is a picture, an example of his coming in the form of a born servant. So Jesus is the one, for those of you in the business circle or in the corporate circle, Jesus is the true representation of God, the true representation of the perfect servant. He walks the talk. He's not the general that says, all of you charge, and then he stays behind. All of you get killed. He goes in front of us. He sets the example. He washes the disciples' feet. This is God washing our feet. He is here, a servant God that is serving us today. So Jesus from God became man to save us. That is humility of the highest order. Jesus identifies with man, Hebrews 4. Jesus shares in our infirmity. So every time you have pain, he has pain. He knows the pain because he came down here as a baby, as a baby so that he experiences our pain throughout from babyhood, boyhood and adulthood. Have you ever wondered why Moses was not made a was not made a, Moses was a deliverer, but not a, a savior in that sense? Because Moses was not identified, or rather Moses was not a priest in that sense, because Moses did not identify with the people. For the first 40 years of Moses' life, he was in, ensconced in uh, luxury. He was in Pharaoh's uh, palace. So he didn't identify with his people. That's why Aaron was asked to be the high priest because Aaron grew up with the people from young. And that's why Jesus today can represent us because Jesus identifies with our infirmities, with our sufferings. He came down as a baby. Jesus didn't come down as a full form man like Adam did. So he experiences all our pains, all our anguish. That's why he's a perfect representation of us. Amen? 2.8 talks about Christ's humility in death and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Now, what can we learn from this scripture verse? Jesus became a shame and a scandal for us. Now, I purposely put in bracket unseemly conduct in the religious person in case some of us think that as a man, he was scandalous because he go and sleep with some of the movies claim in Da Vinci Code or whatever with Mary Magdalene and all these things. So Jesus became a scandal because he was a religious person and he was defying the religious authorities in this world. Yeah? Jesus' death on the cross represented him as disgraceful before man. That's why he became shame for us before mankind. And a curse before God. That's why Galatians 3.13 tells us, Cursed is he who hangs on the tree. Have you ever asked yourself the question, why did Jesus hang on the tree to die? The cross. Why wasn't Jesus stoned to death? Because his punishment was supposed to be thrown to, stoned to death. But he died on the cross because there's a custom and a belief that when you hang on the tree, then you are cursed. And that's why Jesus has got to hang on the tree to show the world that we have been redeemed from the curses. And that's why we are partook of the, the Holy Communion this morning because there's blessings and curses. So when uh, God, the cherubim looks at the eyes, of the, the, the blood of uh, the lamb, when the eyes of God, the judgment eyes of God looks at the blood of Jesus Christ, Curses is satisfied. So when curses is satisfied, what is available for us? Blessings. That's why when the angel of death passed by on the Passover night, they were just looking at the door frame. The, the wooden doors there, there's a picture of the tree of life, the cross, and there's blood. All the family inside that household is saved. It's not about based on the performance of the family's work. So today, as we are in Christ, we are seeing Christ's blood. And that's why we talk about Christ's blood in the Holy Communion. This is my blood shed for you, for the new covenant, not the old covenant. 
The old covenant is about self-performance. New covenant is about Jesus' performance. Amen? Jesus sets the benchmark of humility, of selflessness, of perfect love. God became man, became servant, became criminal, and died for us. That is the extent of humility. Now, if we are humbled by man's standards, have we died for anybody? Have we suffered for anybody? Even uh, I was just giving this example in, in uh, Phnom Penh, just early part of uh, last week. We're talking about charitable works. Sometimes when we even give clothes, religious uh, actions, we give our own clothes. What, what is humility is there? What sacrifice is there? We don't even give our best clothes. No, no please, this is not condemnation. I'm just trying to show you man's idea of humility versus God's idea of humility. Yeah, oftentimes we give clothes, people, clothes to a charity, even the old folks' home that the, our brother Koktian is going to feed, we are giving used food, leftover food. Yeah? If you are that humble, if you are that loving of people, let us give the best in our life. And that's why our Father God is loving of us. He gave the best, His beloved Son. Amen? Paul advises how to be humble. Watch what Jesus does and follow. That's why we have 1 Corinthians 11, 1, very easy to remember, 1, 1, 1, 1, four tongkats. Huh? So you can go leave this particular Sunday morning. Huh? Imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. So as we study the word of God, as we hear God through the Bible, let's understand. And that's why in this church, we preach and teach you all to see Jesus Christ. So that as we see Jesus Christ, the loveliness of Jesus Christ, we want to draw near to Jesus Christ. And as we draw near to Jesus Christ, we know what He does. And we watch what He does. And what He does, we do. Amen? Amen. Again, there's a but. The flesh cannot follow. Imitate me, just as I also imitate Jesus. So we watch what Jesus does. But if we are not spiritually minded, we won't be able to follow. Because if we watch what Jesus does with our carnal mind, with our natural intellect, then we will not be able to follow what Jesus does. So we move on to the fifth segment. The Father exalts Jesus. <clears throat> now, Jesus plumbed the lowest of lowest depth. This is God. God plumbed the lowest of lowest depth. The dirtiest of dirtiest filth. So we might all scale the highest of highest potential God has planned for each and every one of us. Amen? That's why Ephesians 2.10 says, we are his workmanship. You are all not your parents' workmanship because God knew us when we were in uh, our mother's womb. He has already planned for us. So you are his workmanship. And do you agree with me? When Jesus does something, he does something fantastic, beautiful. He doesn't come up with a half-baked uh, cake or a, a flawed diamond. I think... Uh, our sister Stephen can identify with that. Yeah, he comes up with the perfect diamond. I don't know what's the highest uh, carrot in, in diamonds, but that's the best of best of diamonds. Yeah? So we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. And if you have the Holy Spirit leading in us, we cannot help but do good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Again, God prepared beforehand. I think we have heard uh, Susan uh, Hoover's teaching about Isaiah 45 too. He goes before us. It's just like when I go for a, a, a team park ride with my daughter, if I take the roller coaster, I will try out those roller coasters first. So that I know that, yeah, I think my daughter can take that roller coaster. Then I will bring my daughter along. Yeah, amen, she's here. Yeah, so this is our God. He goes before us to take the roller coasters of the storms of life. So that he says, now you can go because I am with you when you're on this roller coaster of ride in life. Because my Holy Spirit is in you. My mind of Christ is in you. Amen? So Christ's exaltation has actually two parts. One, God's past exaltation of Christ and God's future exaltation of Christ. Now let's look at God's past exaltation of Christ. This one is uh, captured in Philippians 2.9. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Amen? Now, this highly exalted, the word highly in Greek means hooper. Hooper means super duper hooper exalted him. Just like we talk about the book of Romans, when sin abounded, 
grace super abounds, grace hyper abounds to overcome the law. Okay? Matthew 23, 12, and whoever exalts himself will be humble. See, if we exalt ourselves, we think, oh, I'm great, you know, I'm, uh, yeah, today I'm not working, you know, but though only this, oh, I'm a senior banker, therefore you all kowtow to me. Yeah, if you do that in the flesh, you'll find that you'll be humble. That's why I'm humble today, I got no job. <laughs> but today I've got the best employer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. It is actually very, very, very satisfying to uh, be just patted on the shoulder to say, do God's work. It is very satisfying. The past one month was very trying for me. I've been traveling to Saigon, uh, teaching again, came back, we took my family for a holiday in Melbourne, came back and then went to Phnom uh, Penh uh, last week. So came back here, preached. Uh, End of the year, I'll be going to Singapore. After that, Jan- end of January, going to Phnom Penh again, so on and so forth. So my calendar, my missions calendar for next year is already mapped out. And my board meetings are also not even planned yet. Uh, and whoever exalts himself will be humble, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Again, here we see uh, Matthew 23, 12, meshing in with Philippians as well too. God is urging us to humble us. If we are humble, then we will be exalted. But again, the but... We on our own can never be humble one. We on our own self will never look after the interests of other people. Amen? So Christ has many names. We're talking about the name above all names. Eh? Christ has many names. Emmanuel, yeah? Wonderful, Counselor, Prince of Peace, the Almighty, the Good Shepherd, the Alpha and the Omega, the Bread of Life, the Light of the World, etc., etc., etc. So what is this name in Philippians 2.9 that Paul is talking about? So I will suggest to you that's a clue because at the end of our Philippians 2.9, he says Christ's name is above every name. So that thing above is a clue to us as to what that name is. The name above every name. That name that is above every name is actually the Hebrew word Yahweh, which is God's own name. That's why in Greek it is called Kurios, Lord. Why did I say that? Because if you look at Philippians 2.11, which we're going to finish off with, this scripture verse, identifies Christ is kurios. That's why it says Christ is Lord. Christ is kurios. And if kurios is Greek for the Lord, Yahweh, then in Hebrew, the name that is above all names is Yahweh. That's why every time we sing Christ is Lord, that's why we sang the song Christ is Lord. Christ is Lord, O come, O ye faithful. That's why I cannot participate in the flesh mob, because I don't know the lyrics. <laughs> Isaiah 42.8 tells us that I am Lord, Yahweh. That is my name. That's why when uh, God pronounced, I'm giving you a name that is above all names, is God is saying that Jesus is God. Jesus is our Lord. That's why every time when we pray our prayer, we say, in Jesus' name. It is not in Li Cheng Hua's name. It's not in Pastor Peter's name. It is in Jesus' name that everything gets done. Now, God's future exaltation of Christ. Philippians 2.10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. That's why we talk about cancer. Cancer is the name or not? God, that's why it's called cancer. So at the name of Jesus Christ, cancer be cast into the sea. Infirmities be cast into the sea. Financial lack be cast into the sea. In the name of Jesus Christ. Not in anybody else's name. Because there's only one way, one truth, and one life. Amen? Of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth. And this is very powerful. You're talking about the name of Jesus Christ. That's why you have this uh, story of the prodigal son when he came back home. Uh, the father gave him a ring, remember? Remember? He gave him three things actually, the robe of righteousness, sandals of sonship, and the ring of authority. And what is the ring of authority that we wear today? I know some of you don't wear your wedding bands, uh, naughty, naughty, uh, all these husbands. Yeah. <laughs> but the ring of authority is the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? Of those in heaven, and of those on earth, and of those under the earth, uh, that's why 40, Isaiah 45, 23 says, I've sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return. That's why this exaltation of Jesus Christ is in the future. 
all God, God has spoken, it has gone out, that this is my righteousness that has gone out. So it will never return, in the sense that it is for the future, forever and ever, for eternity. That to me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. So of those in heaven, and of those on earth, and of those under the earth, that's why you're talking about this gift that is given to us. It's almighty, powerful. Also, you're talking about any name in the angelic realm of those in heaven. These are talking about angelic spirits. That's why all the spirits will have to listen to our command when we speak. That's why the word of the, mouth, the tongue is so powerful. When we speak in the authority, in the name of Jesus Christ, angelic hosts will have to bow down at the name of Jesus Christ. We talk about on those on earth, human beings. That's why when we go through our lives, wherever you are, a student, a worker, a housewife, or whatever, abide in Him. Those who abide in the vine will live. If you don't abide in Him, I'm sorry you don't. Yeah? So, at the name of Jesus Christ again, for human beings on earth. And under the earth, so demonic spirits are also under our, 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 our feet. Philippians 2.11, I'm coming to the end of the verse. Whoa, I'm ahead of time. Do I get a bonus? <laughs> and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Now, what is confession? Confession with the tongue is actually spiritual. That's why we have to be very mindful of the, our tongue. This little, small, little fella can cause a lot of damage. Look at the rudder on a big ship. A small little rudder, it can steer the ship. So similarly with our tongue. So confession with the tongue is actually the spoken counterpart to us, the human beings, bowing their knees in the physical sense. Yeah? Now, confession of Jesus Christ is Lord. Let's examine some of this, uh, meditate on this, this particular phrase. Jesus, the Lord saves. Christ, the anointed or the Messiah. Is. Notice is. Never say Jesus Christ was the Lord. Never say Jesus Christ will be your Lord. It is the now word, the ever-present time. Wherever you are today, wherever you are anywhere in the world, Jesus Christ is with you. Jesus Christ is Lord, Yahweh, your God. The God that I have, the God that we all have. Amen? Short end, this Jesus Christ is Lord is actually the short hand or some, you want to be a bit high sounding, they call it the apostolic shorthand for the gospel. That's why Romans 10, 9 says, when you confess Jesus is Lord, that's why at the end of this uh, service, I will lead you through, if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Romans 10, 9 and Romans 10, 10 says that you believe in your heart, you confess Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you're a new creation. Simple. You don't have to uh, grovel on your feet to have Christ coming into your life. So now we come to the but. Now this is where it gets interesting. But what? Yeah? It is not like I was mentioning earlier on. It is not the nature of the self, the carnal mind, to be other-centered, to be interested in other people. Because we are by nature very selfish. We are by nature very self-centered. The self or the flesh will never humble itself to be other-centered. And that's why we have this story of uh, Martha and Mary. When Jesus went to their house, Martha was again very, very busy working, uh, making chapati or making chakwetia or making noodles or making coffee for Jesus Christ. But Mary did the one thing. Mary rested at Jesus' feet and listened to him. Yeah? And that's why Martha came to Jesus Christ, the guilty party, and then buta buta blamed two people. Blame Jesus Christ. Lord, Lord, don't you care that my sister is not helping me out? So when you are self-righteous, you tend to be very self-centered. You will always put yourself up on the pedestal or you put other people down. But the mind of Christ, as what Philippians 2, 1 to 11 is all about, will then steer us to the will of the Holy Spirit, which empowers us to live the abundant life that God has planned for us of heaven on earth. Now, I don't know about you guys. I'm actually experiencing heaven on earth. Yeah? I may not have uh, 20,000 houses or 20 houses or 100 cars, as some people do, but believe you me, I'm having heaven on earth. And it is also my prayer and wish for each and every one of you to experience God's abundant life in yourself. Now, what is this self or pride? Yeah? 
This is our greatest enemy. And look at the wisdom of God. Because this is the enemy that is within us, that's why it is God's wisdom for us to be transformed from within rather than from without. When we are transformed from without, which is the law, that's why it's called behavioral change. Yeah? When we are transformed from within, then it is heart transformation. And that's why we have renewal of mind. God says that we must have renewal of mind, the mind of Christ that will steer our free will to be led by the Holy Spirit rather than to be led by our carnal flesh and be led. Our carnal flesh, the, the body and uh, the carnal mind all belongs to the world and the world belongs to the devil. Yeah? That's why we have uh, Romans 7, 18. Paul himself says the same thing. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, you see, he uses the word flesh, nothing good dwells. That's why nothing good dwells in ourselves. 19, for the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. And that's why it ends with this famous phrase, he says, oh, wretched me, oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from the body of death? See, the body that belongs to the world. Thank God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then, with the spiritual mind, I myself serve the law of God. Yeah? But in the flesh, I serve the law of sin. Yeah? Let's examine this a bit further. What, what is uh, Paul talking about? What is this flesh, this body, this mind that Paul is talking about? So I will suggest to you, this is a portion of uh, my, my slides that I took from my teaching on uh, spirit, soul, and body. So I, I believe this will uh, help you to understand what is uh, spirit, soul, and body, carnal mind, the flesh, the body, the mind. Amen? The day that we died, Genesis 2, 17b, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. That's why our body is made, our self is made of... Uh, Spirit and soul and body, uh, First Thessalonians tells us that, body, soul and spirit. That's why when Adam partook of the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the spirit man died. How to resurrect the spiritually dead? That's why we have Romans 10.10. 10. If we believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Saviour, we then have new life. And that's why we have the new birth. That's why when old man uh, Nicky, Nicodemus went to Jesus Christ in the middle of the night to say that, hey, how can I be born again? I'm such a huge adult. Oh, by the way, Andrew is the handsomest man in uh, his age category. I'm the handsomest man in my age category. <laughs> and my age category is... Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, that's why Romans 10.10, 10, when we have confessed this thing, we are then spiritually made alive. That's why we have today our body, we have today our soul, the carnal mind, we have today our soul, the spiritual mind. That's why the soul is made out of two components, so to speak. And then we have the spirit. Now, the body and the carnal mind, this is what we call the flesh or the self. The spirit man is made out of our spiritual mind and the spirit. Now, this is where the battleground takes place, the carnal mind and the spiritual mind. Now, I'm putting it before you. This is not a topic on uh, spiritual warfare, so I won't delve into it. Otherwise, I get accused of not keeping things simple. <coughs> okay, this is spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare, my friends, is between our ears, the carnal mind and our spiritual mind. Okay? Our spirit, I would like to assure you, is complete today if you are in Christ. Ephesians 1.13, Colossians 2.10 tells us that our spirit is complete because the Holy Spirit is in us. Our soul has responsibility to exercise free will. That's why we have Romans 8, 6. If you are spiritually minded, it leads to life and peace. If you are carnally minded, it leads to death. Our body will do what it is told. That's why you have the, ours is a God of order. The spirit's will, then the spiritual mind of Christ will tell us what to do, and then it will influence us the body. Come to church. That's why we come to church and partake of good bread of life. Amen? The spirit is the, like the power source, the light here. But the soul is like the switch. If we don't switch on the switch, we don't get the, the power source. Or like this good friend of mine was giving, giving me the analogy. The, the spirit is like sunlight. The soul is like the curtains, the, wind, the curtain windows. If we don't open the curtain windows, light will not shine into our rooms. Light will not shine into our lives. Amen? God will not violate our free will. 
The only time is when final judgment. When he says time's up, EK will cough twice or say amen twice, and God will do likewise. Say, time's up, day of judgment, no more free will. God has had enough with his people. The mind of Christ, this one is received in our spirit man. Remember, I told you the spirit man is made up of our spiritual mind and our spirit. Functions as the switch in our soul, so we make the right choices, as I've already explained to you in Romans 8, 6. But how do we do this? How do we practice switching on the right time, switching on our spiritual mind? And how we do this is very simple, because our Lord Jesus has really instructed us, just one thing only, one thing is needful. One thing is needful. Just here, rest. That's why we, in this church we talk so much about resting in Christ, not just sleeping in bed and, and lazing the day, whole day through, but resting in Christ. And then we hear him. And how do we hear him? Because Mary sat at the feet of Jesus Christ. Where is Jesus Christ today? Jesus Christ's Holy Spirit is in our hearts. And every time we open this book, this is our showbread table. This is our communion table. Every time we open this book, we partake of the bread of life. We partake of the blood of Christ. And this is where God talks to us. That's how we hear Christ. Yeah? I believe this is one of the main ways. Obviously, there are other ways. You come and uh, listen to good anointed Christian teachings. You come to a good church. I know of many churches in town that preach good messages. So God's word is spirit and it gives life. I didn't say so. Jesus himself says so. That's why like John 6, 63. The words that I speak to you are spirit. That's why when we read the Bible, we have got to read it with our spiritual mind. We cannot read it with just our natural intellect. Yeah? So because the words that I speak, Jesus is talking. Every time you open the Bible, picture Jesus sitting in front of you, talking to you. I speak to you as spirit, and they are life. What is this life? Zoe life to your bodies. Our spirit then bears witness with the choice of our spiritual mind and imparts godly wisdom. Godly wisdom is nothing more than revelation knowledge. Yeah? And once we have revelation knowledge, I say revelation is not head knowledge, but this is heart knowledge. Yeah? It suddenly comes from within that only the spiritual mind can understand. And how do we activate the spiritual mind? That's why we have spiritual intimacy. That's why we are exalted to day and night be Christ conscious. And that's why Brother E.K. again was talking about the mana. Mana came down daily because there's a picture of how we're supposed to feed on God's word daily. God didn't rain down mana for one week, for one month, or for one year so that we can now keep all these things in the refrigerator and then go and hurrah hurray. God wants you to be dependent on Him on a daily basis because He is a good God. He's our good Father who knows how to take care of our provision. Okay? Now, you look at this. Let's re re remind ourselves with this. Uh, aren't they cute? All these blue smurfs. If you look carefully at it again, if you take a step back and look at the whole totality of what's happening here, this is actually the tree of self. I paraphrase it. It's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So the carnal mind and our body is basically the tree of self. And our spiritual mind and our spirit is basically the tree of life. And this is exactly what's happening here in this Bible. Let, let me give you a quiz, little quiz. If today all of us here with our present day knowledge and you're transported back to the Garden of Eden, and then you have two trees. How many will eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Oh, praise God. This is a wise church. Nobody raise their hands. And Jesus is telling us the same thing. Today, as we enter the Garden of Eden, let's eat from the tree of life. Let's not learn from the law. Let's not partake of the fruit from the tree of self. Amen? So here we have it, the hallmark of grace. You want to be joyful, being a joyful person, if you're a citizen of heaven, you should walk in victory, you should walk in joy in the Holy Spirit, and that's the hallmark of grace. And that's why you, when you come to this church here, you find that everybody is happy, joyful. Yeah? And to do that, we walk in humility, and Paul gave us this example of Christ's humility for us to emulate, watch what Jesus does, and follow. And that's how our Father God will then exalt us. Yeah? And we can only do that, like I say, provided we have the spiritual mind of Christ. That will then give our free will to say that, yes, Lord, I choose you. And then that's where the Holy Spirit is then empowered to do His good works in our lives. Amen? 
So Jesus wants to live our lives for us. Galatians 2.20 says that. Yeah? Yet we choose to live our lives by ourselves. We want to be independent. And that's the nature of the world because I don't know how old you guys are, but I'm 60, 16 years old. Okay, 60 years old. <clears throat> but for the better part of my life, before I found uh, the revelation of the grace message, it was all self-effort. Even my secular life, even our children's life, you get 10 A's, you get 10 ringgit. You get zero A's, you cannot 10 K names. Yeah? It's always performance oriented. That's why Romans 8.13 tells us very clearly, if you live according to the flesh, and we really determine that the flesh means our body. Wow, oh, I see good food. I've been taking a lot of chilies, that's why I got this cough. That's why my wife is very watchful of me now. <laughs> if you live according to the flesh, you will die. The body and the carnal mind. But if you live by the Spirit, you will live. Again, the choice is ours. So I would close with this little uh, picture. Hopefully you will be blessed by it. Like I say, the four Smurf blue boys there. A body, the soul, and the carnal mind. This is a picture of the tree of self. Yeah? Or the law. The spiritual mind and the spirit is our tree of life. So today, again, two trees are set before you. Don't make the same mistake that Adam did. Please, partake of the tree of life. And interestingly enough, allow the tree of life to grow in yourself, to subsume the tree of self. And the tree of life, the book of Romans tells us, have you ever found a tree with uh, more than one fruit? If you have a mango tree, do you expect to find apple fruit there? No, isn't it? But the tree of life, God tells us in the book of Romans, has got 12 fruits. 12 is the number of governance. And that's how God wants to govern our lives, live our lives out for us in compliance with his laws. Yeah? So partake of the tree of life. And how do you do that? You can only do that by being Christ-minded. So in closing, I would encourage you to be Christ-minded, eat from the tree of life, and live his abundant life. And you can only do that with the cross. On your own, we will die. And how do we do that? Again, do the one thing that Jesus exhort us all to do, Mary. The one thing, rest at his feet and hear him. Amen? Amen. Now, for some of you who have not accepted uh, Jesus Christ into your lives, this is as good an opportunity as any. I believe that for those of you who do not have Jesus Christ in our lives and who is attending TNC right this moment, you didn't come here by accident. You came here by the divine pre-planning of God. This is an awful and awesome moment, a very important moment, where you make the biggest, biggest, biggest decision of your lives. If you want to receive our Lord Jesus as our Lord and Savior, uh, just follow me in this prayer. And the whole church may want to join me in this prayer as well, too, to encourage our brothers and sisters. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father God for sending your son to die on the cross for each and every one of us, for the whole of humanity. Thank you, Lord, for forsaking your son, God that should come down to earth as man to die for us. Such humility. Thank you, Lord. We believe with our hearts that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. We invite Jesus to come into our lives right this minute. And in Jesus' name we pray this. And you have said this prayer, today you're a child of God. If you need more information, please feel free to come to any one of us, the leadership, and we can ex help explain the uh, gospel to you. Amen. In Jesus' name, we give praise and thanks. Thank you.